Welcome to the Soda Podcast. We're talking about the Data Dream Team with Jesse Anderson. There's a new approach needed to align how the organization, the team, the people are structured and organized around data. New roles, shifted accountability, breaking silos, and forging new channels of collaboration. We'll be talking about it all. The lineup of guests is fantastic. We're excited for everyone to listen, learn, and like. Without further ado, here's your Data Dream Team host, Jesse Anderson. Hello and welcome to the Data Dream Team podcast. My name is Jesse Anderson. With me today is Eric Webb. He is the head of data science at Bull.com. Welcome, Eric. Would you mind introducing yourself a little bit more? Thanks, Jesse, for sure. Um, hi, I'm Eric. I'm head of data science at Bull.com, where I currently oversee uh, dozens of teams and I'm tasked to making sure that picking up the topics that will benefit all of them end up on my plate and whilst doing so, also raising the bar on how we adopt and apply data science uh, at Bold.com. Excellent. So since we were talking about Bold.com, could you go a little bit deeper into it and what it is? Sure. Uh, so Bold.com is the uh, biggest online retailer in the Benelux region, so in the northwestern part of Europe, uh, serving uh, about a dozen million customers um, and um, a general retailer as such, um, so offering you everything you would need in daily life um, for people who need outside of Europe, uh, compare it to what Amazon has to offer, but then indeed in a um, Dutch and local flavor. And I just realized, does Beth, B-O-L, does that stand for an acronym for Best Online Retailer? It it should. It's um, no. It comes from the heritage um, where we are a former subsidiary of Bertelsmann, so it, which is a German company, which um, back in about 1995 was exploring whether or not they should move online, um, and that's basically where the name comes from, Bertelsmann Online, uh, which used to have several uh, brands across Europe in different countries, um, but we're the only one that. Um, managed the ball.com uh, burst, basically, um, and still has the international allure with the .com there. Um, but that's where the name originates from. Okay. And you mentioned before that you're expanding into the French market. Is, is that correct still? Yeah, it sure is. It's um, Ball.com is one of the brands of Ahol Del Hez, um, which is a uh, mainly a supermarket chain, which has brands across uh, Europe and the U.S., and one of our supermarket partners, Del Hez, uh, also has a large collection of stores in the French-speaking part of Belgium. We were always present in the northern uh, Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, but we're now also expanding to the southern part um, to make sure that we get the most value out of bringing the brands together uh, and also using the stores there, uh, for instance, as a pickup or drop-off point. Um, but in order to do that, we should also tailor to the French-speaking market and as such, indeed, are translating into French. Excellent. And you shared that you have about 12 million users. Are there any other numbers that you can share publicly, for example, orders per second, traffic, that sort of thing? It's um, If you look at the, the website, there all the, the big numbers are there. Uh, but I think the biggest ones to share is that it is a, a multi-billion revenue company. Uh, so indeed, as such, quite sizable. Um, we store a few terabytes of data, um, one to power all of our core processes, but also indeed to be able to power all of our data science teams. Um, but indeed, if you look at the numbers uh, during the peak season, uh, you indeed see we have thousands of search queries a second um, and so many interactions, it's just unfathomable on how big that come, it can become. Um, but also knowing that the moment I will tell you today, it's already outdated uh, tomorrow. Um, but be sure to check out the website because it has all the numbers there that we can share publicly at the moment. Excellent. Excellent. So let's talk about you personally. You personally have a master's in applied physics. Could you tell me more about how, that, how you've taken that master's in physics and applied it in analytics? Sure, happy to do so. Um, so when I finished secondary school, um, you get maybe for the first time the big question of okay, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to become when you grow up? Um, 
And there I figured, I want to understand how the world works. And for me, the best way to understand how the world works is by learning physics. So you see a phenomena, you build a hypothesis of how it could work, and then you test that using experiments. And that's, I think, a philosophy that I still apply to my work every single day. Um, we have a challenge with a customer or with a partner. We think about how we can best help them overcome that problem or, uh, or solve it, and then test that in real life as soon as we can. Um, and that mindset is something I use every day. So every uh, data scientist will be familiar with experimentation. Physics is basically experimentation is a bread and butter there. Um, so that's something you apply every single day. But also the, um, the critical mindset and being able to separate um, main contributions to smaller contributions, which I think is a key part of an applied physics uh, background, uh, is something that still is very useful. Um, yes, there are a thousand things you could think of or could further improve, but these are the three things that matter most to make an impact um, that I still make a lot of use of. So I find that interesting because uh, I see some people trying to chase after every single stone or every single rabbit that they see. And what I found an interesting as you were talking is figuring out what was the most interesting rabbit to chase after. What, what sort of suggestions would you give to data scientists and say, here is how you find the most interesting rabbit to chase after? I think first would be is... Um, understand why you chase the rabbit at all. For instance, if you chase the rabbit for the sake of you need to have food, um, be sure that that's the reason why you chase it. Um, it's not about building the most beautiful trap or the most elaborate way to catch it. You catch it because you're hungry. And if you always keep the end goal in mind and then start to think about how can I achieve that, that's when it will become most effective. And to translate that into the real life application of a data scientist every single day is that if you get to solve a business problem by writing 10 lines of SQL code, scheduling that and making that available, that's the way to be effective. That's the way to build uh, credibility and to build a reputation for yourself of being someone that can actually solve your problem that you can then always leverage on a later point in time uh, for the more fancy stuff, for the more modeling stuff. And that I think is key for um, what I'm seeing, at least for the more junior people entering the field, is that I've learned modeling, so now I should do modeling instead of um, I'm here to, to chase that same rabbit because I'm hungry. And if it's a lot easier to, to pick berries, um, you should go for that. Apologies if I took the metaphor too far there, Jesse. No, I love berries too. So yes, it's. I think these are there's some key early lessons for for early early data scientists that I, I see it happening too much. Where I think in school people are taught how to solve a problem, but they're not taught whether to what the problem to solve is. It's kind of here's your ABC test rather than okay, which one of ABC should you s seek after. Uh, another it's for sure, and maybe to uh, to build on that, what I, what I typically see happening uh, in the field of data science that people enter the field from either three angles. Either you come from the angle of engineering, you know how to build things. You come from the angle of um, a formal data science background, you know how to model the world. Or you come from the angle of business analytics, you know how to solve a problem. And it takes years to... Um, complements the one skill that you get from university with one of the two others um, before you become truly effective in the field. And I love always to see people in need uh, making that journey, making the transition of, okay, I already mastered one of these three things, which is the one, the one that I need to be effective um, and how can I complement the third one with the people around me um, within a team to make sure I can be as effective as I want to be. Good. So you were told that you were one of the most effective data scientists without knowing you were a data scientist. Tell me about what that meant and why that happened. 
<laughs> yeah, that was that was a happy surprise. No, I still um, I, st- I still vividly remember that moment. We were walking down the hall and having one of these um, serendipitous conversations when someone actually told me that. Um, I think you are the most effective data scientist we have in the company. Like, oh, why is that? Uh, yeah, you're you're pragmatic and and uh, even without too many tooling and 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 uh, technology, you just go out there and try stuff. And that, to some extent, um, made me realize, oh wait, maybe I am already working as a data scientist without being fully aware of that, uh, because indeed, as a, a trained physicist. Um, you're not that exposed to the whole field of data science. And back in the day when I was in university, um, data science as such, I still think was very much emerging. Um, But that was the first experience. And I think from that point on, um, having a a gut feel of what the power of of data and and how it can improve our business has always been there. just the vocabulary wasn't aligned with what is most common in industry by now. Um, But that luckily has changed a lot over the last few years. And so now going deeper into that physicist or being a physicist, we've talked about experimentation. You, You said before, throw hard problems at physicists. Tell me more about why you said that. Yes, I think if you look at uh, history in, in the last uh, 100 years. Um, I think in quite a few cases you've seen that if there's a big, uh, hard, audacious beast, um, quite often it has been physicists that, that started to look at a problem and approach it from different angles to see if they could find a solution to make it work. Um, and of course, indeed, uh, many famous examples have been uh, are known from, from wartime. Uh, when we need to um, have bigger, stronger weapons and to um, to build things nuclear powered even. Um, but also if you look in more recent times, uh, the most, uh, or at least the initial solutions, for instance, in uh, making feeds more relevant, so uh, news feeds, social media feeds, um, quite often it has been physicists that were looking at that on how to uh, overcome that. If you look at the... Uh, original designs of, for instance, for the Enigma machine for, for cryptography, um, happy physicists. And I know for a fact that I'm, I'm hugely biased in this perception being one myself as well. Um, but I think it shows that if you have a problem and you don't know where to begin at all, it's often very useful to add a generalist to it, someone that knows a lot uh, from a lot of different things a little bit, and to move it one stage further in our understanding um, before any any more specialized people to it. Um, And I think to translate that back to to daily life uh, and to the teams that we run also here at Bold.com, when we are faced with a new problem, a problem we've never seen before, uh, we tend to first offer that to a generalist someone who knows um, asking the right questions, knows how to do exploratory data analysis, knows how to build a, um, a first model and bring it live to production, uh, much more so than already introducing two, three, four specialists as a team, uh, because you simply don't know yet what the problem uh, will look like uh, if you look der- deeper into it. And that might be one of the reasons why I also need stumbled into the field of, of, of data science in the stage where I was at, um, because no one knew what data science would exactly entail uh, for us at the company. Um, and maybe the generalist there could help indeed shape that and um, build our understanding. So I think there it's, um, uh, if you look at history, I think I've seen that a physicist typically is the journalist that can bring the problem from the original challenge to the first 60% solution. And after that, you should surely add more specialists uh, to bring it a lot further. Uh, That's interesting that you talk about generalists that way. Uh, Another friend of mine and person who's been on the show, Paco Nathan, spoken pretty much the same thing and said, we need more generalists. These generalists will be able to help us. And then you, I think you touched on something that's pretty important, is that they'll help shape or form that problem. Uh, 
so you've said before that physicists can get you to that 60 to 80 percent. Is, th- is that your take as well? It's, um, it's what I've seen happen a lot. Um, so there, of course, indeed, there is no way in, in um, generalizing over all of them. Um, but that's what I'm, I'm seeing a lot. So although most people that I've studied with, also myself, have all been trained in applied physics, um, they have ended up in a wide range of fields where they're currently working. Um, some indeed still in, in hardcore physics. Um, quite a few of them entrepreneurs. Some have end, ended up in uh, venture capital, in fintech. Um, some of them have become teachers. Um, but most of them are indeed ending up in uh, in new fields in where creativity and um, solving problems that few people have solved before are their bread and butter, um, which they're also attracted to. Um, so it might be a chicken and egg problem is that the type of people that come from that uh, education tend to look for problems that uh, they like to solve or it's the other way around. Um, for that one, I'm not quite sure, uh, but that's something that I see happen quite a bit, yeah. So now let's reverse the problem. How do you finish off that last 20 to 40 percent? It's, um, again, in, in, the, in essence, it's a simple one. Um, it's about realizing that two things. Um, you never have one person that can solve the entire value chain from, uh, from zero to one. And second, it's about understanding um, how specialities and how teams work to make that come about. Um, so for the first one is, although I think I am quite capable of, of um, breaking down a, uh, a challenge into its core components, um, there are many things that I'm a lot, le- a lot, a lot less good at. Um, so for instance, don't expect me to um, uh, to structure things really well. I'm not the one that focuses the most on uh, on efficiency, as well as I have seen others do that. Um, realizing that, internalizing that, acknowledging that, and being vocal about that um, opens up the stage for for other people to step in and to help. Um, where I think you should also need to be able to step over your own uh, shadow and realizing that um, the person that got the team, the department from A to B might not be the same person that uh, the organization need to bring from B to C as well, which I think is is the first one. Um, I think the second is about um, generalists versus specialists, is that I feel that people's skill set um, to some extent, basically, they span a um, uh, they span a space. And the space as a whole can uh, can grow over time, um, but the two vertices either indeed um, are uh, wide or narrow, but then they go deeper. And where a generalist typically knows uh, something about a lot of things, a specialist typically knows a lot about a few things, and if your problem is already more advanced, more detailed, uh, and more known on what you'll be facing, uh, finding a specialist to tackle that is exactly what you need. Um, If I take an example from our day-to-day life in one of our teams, um, we have been recommending uh, products to our customers for uh, for over a decade. We know that it helps our customers uh, explore their ways and their needs within our um, tens of millions of products by catalog. We know that the need is there. However, how to do that effectively at that scale uh, requires quite a lot of detailed knowledge about um, data processing, engineering, neural nets, everything that comes with that. Knowing we have a need for that allowed us to hire um, a few dedicated specialists to really look into that. Um, Several people who have indeed PhDs into uh, the fields of, of image processing. So there we had the luxury of knowing that we need people with a uh, specialized bit of knowledge within neural nets and we're able to hire them uh, because one, we could tell them the challenge we have, why it's interesting for you. 
And we also knew that making the investment for us would last for uh, the years to come. Um, and I'm really glad that we did that because now indeed we have a lot of exciting uh, products there ongoing where not only we recommend products based on uh, on who you are, um, but also uh, to inspire you or to um, pique your interest or to um, offer you products based on the look that you have. So which dress matches your shoes, those kind of things, um, which I think sets us apart in online retail, um, which is just exciting stuff. Now, I'm curious your experience on this. Uh, in my experience, that we have a long tail problem, where the amount of effort to get to, let's say, sixty to eighty percent, is much smaller than the last twenty percent. Is that your experience as well? Often so. A few indeed uh, examples. Um, uh, he maybe underlined the truth of it, but mostly so. Yes. Okay. So we were originally introduced by Niels Bastjes, and if for those who don't know, he is he's one of the most phenomenal both architects and programmers I've talked to in a while. I, I met him at Berlin Buzzwords. If I were a recruiter and trying to trying to poach somebody, I'd be going after Niels. And no, 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 don't don't try to poach him. Okay, forget that name. <laughs> yeah, don't don't take him. So. In this case, uh, he is he, he's really good at what he does. We had some pretty in-depth conversations that you, you're not able to do most of the time. So let's say you don't have somebody like Nils. What do you do? There, I to some extent argue that within every company, you always have a Nils. However, um, with growing scale and growing complexity, um, the level of, of depth and, um, and weight of knowledge just becomes even bigger. Um, but you always need someone that you need in a certain area within your company and it pushes the bounds in one direction. Um, and I think there are two things that uh, you need to make that happen. I think with the first one you already uh, shared there, Jesse, is you need someone that um, can translate a problem that you have into the steps that need to be taken. Um, not, they don't have to fully internalize the problem themselves and, and know all the steps to take, but they know this is what I want to solve and I don't have this expertise. I need to find someone that can actually do this for me. Um, Second, the thing that you need is you need to have some level of urgency or drive to actually go for that. Because acquiring a new technology, acquiring new people uh, is an investment upfront um, that comes with uncertainty, comes with risk, and you need to have a reason to take those. Um, but if you have those two, if you have a drive um, to do something new, bold, challenging, um, and you have someone that can translate that challenge into what's technically um, looked for or required, uh, then you have the core ingredients. Because then indeed it's uh, for people like, also like Niels, um, it's for them, okay, this is what I want to solve. Can you help me fix that? He'll say, yes, just let me have a crack at it um, and I'll get back to you. And that's indeed relying on the craftsmanship of others. Uh, for them to solve the problem and to get back to you on how to fix that, which I think is a uh, wonderful uh, wonderful distribution to have also within how you organize within. So now let's switch a, a little bit back. Let's switch back to you. You recently, or within the past few years, switched from being an individual contributor to a manager. Why did you make that switch? Long story short, um, I want to have the experience. I wanted to know what is it like um, to have a different role. Is that something that would suit me? Is that something that I would be uh, skilled at? Is that would be something that would challenge me for days, months, years to come? Um, and as a data scientist, I ran the experiment. So it's curiosity that um, that got me there, because philosophizing about is this something I would want, is this something that would appeal to me, can only get you so far. Um, so when the opportunity came, 
I grabbed it with both hands, and um, it got me where I am today. So we, we've we've seen this theme of you liking to experiment, and so as as I've think, thought about the experiments in my life, I don't think I've caught the, called them experiments. I think of it more of an engineer of as an engineer of how far can I go without breaking? We can test this, but let's not test it to failure. Let's test it just slightly, slightly less than failure. How do you do that in life, where you're you you have to eat, you have to live, you? How do you do an experiment that doesn't break you, as it were? It's it's um, the way you phrase it. I have not done an experiment. For me, uh, at least how you describe it, it's it's just as much an experiment as anything else. Um, let's go into the area that's unknown. Um, let's see what happens. Uh, let's build a feedback loop of hey, it hasn't broken yet. Can I? Can I push it further? Do I want to push it further? If the answer is yes, why not? Um, so maybe you, you're also a bit of more of a data scientist than you already realized there, uh, Jesse. Um, but then to come to your question on, on how do you balance that, um, I think one of the, the key um, deliberations I typically take there, and I think I actually stole the metaphor from, uh, from Jeff Bezos there, is about realizing for the choice that I'm making, is it a one-way door or a two-way door? Which in essence means so much as if I say yes to testing this, to this experiment, and it fails, is there a way back, yes or no? And as long as there is a way back that doesn't cost you too much, go for it. Try it. See what happens and uh, the experience will always make you uh, richer than you came in. Um, and see what happens. The thing there is, is, is although in the, my hair is graying, I'm not quite sure whether the people can actually hear that on a podcast already, but it's, um, it's graying. Um, I am just 15 years into my working career out of 45. Uh, that's a third in. That's the stage where you should be exploring a lot, lot more than you should be exploiting. Um, because you have 30 more years to go. You better end up in a place where you are um, both convinced and, and very passionate about where you are um, and where you want to spend your time. And for me, the only way to, uh, to confirm that uh, is by running experiments, by testing things out and by experiencing firsthand what it's like. Um, and as long as you do that in areas where even if the experience is not what you were hoping for, but you can always turn back, always go for those. So you say something interesting and valuable, I think, for people who are listening. So I wanted to, to just dig into that. And that is, in my personal life, as I've made a decision, that's the sort of calculus I've done too. And that is, mm -hmm. if I, for example, when I started my business, if I start my business and I fall flat on my face, what's the undoability of that? And then to add on to what you were talking about, there is a certain level of cachet or benefit to what you're doing. So let's say I had started my business and followed flat on my face. I now have this view that other, let's say, engineers don't have of, I actually ran a business. I know what what it takes to market and sell and do this and that, and that's valuable to to a company. Similar to you, you saw that there was value. Even if you saw it, went into management and said, oh, I don't want to do this, there's value to being able to say, yeah, I've managed for a bit, and maybe I'm not a, a line manager, maybe not I'm a director, but maybe I'm a team lead, and that background in management helps me out, and I just don't have to deal with some of that. Is that about what you're, you're thinking as well? Uh, for sure. For sure, it's um, um, to, to, to take one example, I think, for um, what you've just said. In the various roles I've had over the last few years, um, I've had times where I was a, um, a line manager for 14 people as well. Um, currently, I am uh, officially a line manager for two, which means to some, uh, to some people, uh, that's having 12 people less as your direct reports. For which also in the beginning I figured, okay, is that something I care about? Is that something that I find important? Is that something that I 
want to have in, um, in my job and my career. But I didn't know. So again, there, I figured, okay, let's try it. And the thing I found in how I currently operate and, and do my work is that I spend almost as much time in, um, in coaching others, in giving them feedback and trying to make them as effective as they can be without it being my formal responsibility. Just because I've experienced how much fun I find it to be to be able to do that with people, um, to give them those experiences and that, those perspectives back for them to, um, to reflect on and to adopt if they would prefer that. Um, and not, having, not requiring that to be uh, formalized on paper as well. I've learned that for me, uh, leadership is something that's, um, that's a mindset, not something that is stored in a database. Um, and the only way that I could have learned that is by picking up all these different roles. Um, and I'm loving that to every to the day uh, as today. So speaking of that leadership and, and making a change, what did you do to prepare you to start leading a data science team? <laughs> That's that. That's a good question. Um, having been chucked into the deep end at some point, <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether that there was that much time to prepare. Um, but no, I think um, uh, a mixture of of two things. Um, one, I think there's a, a wonderful corpus of uh, of books and experiences uh, from. Uh, people that have gone before you are readily available out there. Um, so just reading up on, on books, on leadership, on different styles, on different perspectives um, that can help you find your own way and uh, view on leadership. And second, um, which might not so much be, be preparation up front, but more something that um, I've learned uh, quite rapidly into my tenure and in, into management, um, is being open about uh, what you're good at, where your weaknesses are at, what you know, what you don't know, um, and share that with the people around you and not uh, fake it until you make it and, and try to bluff your way through things because people will, will catch that. They will see through it, through it um, and it will hamper both of your um, learning experiences and, and relationships and it's just way too detrimental. You mentioned reading some books. What books would you recommend to everybody? Um, I think on the first hand, it's uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, I think the, the classic from Covey, um, which is for me, it always sounded very clickbaity, but it's generally a really good book and a framework to, uh, to help you move forward. Um, I've highly enjoyed uh, Turning the Ship Around about a submarine captain who indeed uh, literally was thrown into the deep end into his leadership style, um, which shows very practically how he did that um, in a very um, unexpected setting. So within a, a military setting, which is typically a lot more hierarchical, um, he adopted a completely different leadership style, uh, which in my perspective is a lot more effective, I'm trying not to spoil the book too much for, uh, for future readers. And um, I've really appreciated uh, The Trillion Dollar Coach, by Bill, uh, well, the story about Bill Campbell. He didn't um, write himself. It's a wonderful look into um, how having a few core principles and living up to those can almost make life ridiculously easy. But in practice, it's harder than it seems. Um, which for me was also truly inspiring on how to make the tough choices, um, how to pick who you should coach and who not, and how to prepare for that. Um, which I think are three people, uh, three books already that um, people could just dive into. I've I've read all those. Those are all very good recommendations. So what? Uh, mm, let me see. Oh yes. Uh, what methodology do you use on a day-to-day -day basis in your teams? Is it a Scrum or something else? So if you look at um, the teams that we have, um, we have a little over 20 different teams within Bolt.com uh, that have one of our data scientists in them. Um, for all of them, 
we give them the mantra, um, you build it, you run it, you love it, which uh, is our equivalent of we provide you with all the context that you would need to solve your problem, but how you solve it, that's up to you. Uh, so as such, there's not one way how the, the teams run and operate, it's up for them. Of course, we're also seeing that some methodologies are more effective than others um, in order to build great products. One tangible example there is we've seen that the traditional Scrum, so you work on a fixed set of challenges for two weeks uh, with the marketplace and scoping and everything there, just doesn't fit the data science um, workflow as well as other uh, activities would. Um, simply because you don't know how long it will take to uh, to clean and to prepare your data. You might come to uh, a very messy data set, you might run into a very clean data set, not that often, but that's often very hard to predict until you actually dive in. So we are finding that uh, Kanban typically suits the teams a lot better, where you always have a stack rank of the most important problems that you would like to fix, um, you scope only the, the, the three most important problems that will um, keep you busy for the next three to six months. And everything beyond that, it's on the backlog. I don't even care um, because I'm not going to spend and waste time on detailing those, um, which you need to then break down uh, into more manageable tasks. But always pick the first one, uh, pick the most valuable ones first um, and work, at, work it as hard as you can. Um, and only if things take a lot longer than you were expecting on front or the professionals you need run into challenges that they were just not foreseeing, then reiterate on your approach. Uh, but Kanban is typically the most effective way of working that I'm finding today. And as we've seen from your style, you're very highly experimental. Tell me about the team experiments that you've run. <laughs> it's... Um, Oh, there, there are a few there. It's um, maybe maybe the, the the best one that I've um, that I've run is um, this is all the way back in twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen, I think. Um, we had a team already working on uh, on forecasting, and we knew that within our entire logistics operations, um, the deployment of data science was was very slim, and uh, especially within uh, warehouse operations, you should be looking more into operations research than pure data science, but for sake of argument, we'll, um, uh, we'll put them under, under the same denominator. And I had basically, I had, I had one person um, to spare, uh, one person with, uh, with some time free on her hands. Um, so I said, hey, go out there, um, talk to a few people, uh, see who you can find is, uh, is interested into trying something new um, to basically build a build a beachhead. A first um, ground hold on, on where we can basically um, build a reputation, our name for ourselves, and then continue the work there. And that was wonderful uh, because she had all the time in the world, um, no requirements, um, no needs for, for, for stringent reporting. Um, and I trusted her to make all the right choices in, in where the biggest opportunities were. And that freedom, I think, allowed her to um, basically explore without uh, being held back. And I think it was a few months before um, we started to build our own uh, in-house solution for a traveling salesman problem on how we do order picking within the warehouses. And the fun thing is, is that now, four years later, um, we have 16 full-time data scientists within the entire um, logistics operations, all resulting from that single experiment. Um, and there indeed, they are now really pushing the bounds on uh, not solving the, uh, the simple problem. They also need looking at, okay, now we solve five of these problems. How do we make sure that we do not end up in five local minima? But how do we make sure that all of these solutions also generate a global um, minima? And that's a real cool thing to do. Uh, they're looking into challenges like how do we make a digital twin or a full um, uh, setup that can do reinforcement learning over our entire setup? Um, 
to make it even better than we have. And all of those things basically resulted from having one person, giving them free time to uh, explore and to figure out, can we make this work? Um, which resulted in, a, in, in a now already wonderful team. And I think if we were to look back in three more years, uh, three times more, um, I'm looking at that team to be doubled or maybe even tripled uh, because they're doing a lot of really cool stuff. Speaking of goals for your teams, you have much more overarching or much more long-term goals for data teams. Could you talk more about what goals you have? My role specifically needs focuses on things that makes all of the individual teams more effective um, in terms of how can we share uh, knowledge more effectively, how can we um, uh, build better products, how can we make sure that the um, time spent on OPEX is lower, those kind of topics. Um, so as a result, the goals that I and the rest of my leadership typically look at um, are indeed a lot more long-term focused and maybe slightly different than most teams would have. So for instance, we look at, um, is data science self-evident for everyone within the company? Which is our way of uh, trying to build or to create basically uh, 6,000 eyeballs within the company that look at our business in a way that the data scientists might also look at it. Because those can generate so much more ideas on um, where we can adopt discipline than just indeed the data scientists themselves would. So that's one of the goals that we're looking into. Uh, but the other one, for instance, is uh, making sure that we are the best company in the region to um, to deploy data science and to learn how to put that into practice. For which we're now only need looking into, um, into churn. Are we able to keep people with the company and keep them engaged for a lot longer uh, compared to relevant benchmarks? So for instance, compared to other companies or to uh, compared to other roles within a company, uh, because we believe that we have something unique to offer that should result in people staying with us for longer. But of course, that's typically a, um, a metric and a goal that's already measured in years. So influencing that is, of course, also immediately a long-term goal as well. And you also mentioned some impact in academia. How would, what, what would you like to change in academia? Now, what, what I would like to change mostly is um, making sure that the, um, the gap between academia and industry becomes smaller and smaller. Um, because there we have a lot of bright minds um, pushing the boundary of science and looking into new methodologies and new technologies um, for which as long as they, they remain with academia uh, they do not benefit society to the extent that they could. Um, so there we're looking into ways to basically make that gap smaller and to bridge it to make sure that if we need new technology on, uh, on forecasting becomes available we can also use it for our operational planning. If we have new technologies in, um, in learning to rank or in multimodal search, uh, we can translate that into products we can actually give to our customers um, to basically help them find uh, the things they are looking for a lot faster, easier, or things they were even yet unaware of they were looking for um, there as well. And I think one great example that, um, that we've recently done is bring people together on, for instance, on recommender systems to make sure that um, the goals that we had, making things relevant, recommended, and for instance, also using the same information that you provide to us as a customer within your current session, within your current visit, feed that back into a uh, recommender system that can already incorporate that between different page visits. So the moment that you click a certain product and you're transferred into a next page, that second page already shows you information which is more relevant because it incorporates information from the, from the page you've just visited into that next one, which um, as a concept, as a human, is not that hard to, to comprehend. But if you translate that into what it means on a technical level, that's quite impressive. And that's where I'm really happy that we, for instance, also work with the University of Amsterdam um, to incorporate everything that they know into the teams that we currently have. 
I have one request for our listeners. If you are listening to this and you're part of one of those academic institutions and you have something that you want to share on the show, please do reach out so that we can, because mostly what we've done has been really focused on industry. I would like to hear from academicians as well. But I really do love that you're trying to make that change in academia. Uh, you're coming at it from the data science side. I've been on various uh, boards, uh, review boards, that sort of thing. And to a T, the issue is what's being taught in college for engineering, software engineering, is very different than what we're doing in industry. And you could say, well, there's, there's that problem, but what's, it's, it's causing a problem for the students. Those students generally have to come out and get a job on day one. So the further they are from getting a job, the further they are from paying off those student loan debt, or if they're from the U.S. or in Europe, getting that job. So it's it's a real, really, really key thing. And then on the employer side, that means that it's going to take even longer for that person to become productive. So it it is a key thing that we need to be doing at, as an industry, as as a whole industry, not just in software engineering, data engineering, but also data science. For sure, and I think it, it it's. Um Again, one of those key examples where you see two things. On the one hand, the whole field of data science is, relatively speaking, um, still quite immature. So we're still learning on on, um, how we can best embed that into products and how to develop that. But also we're seeing that um, a lot of areas within the field of data science, they are a a true team sport. You need to have an analyst, a software engineer, a product owner, and a data scientist come together to build great products. That's on a team level. Um, but I think also on, on the longer timelines that you just uh, mentioned is that being able to keep advancing the field, we also need to have um, the feedback loop between indeed industry, academia, society work as well um, to make sure that we share with each other what we have and what we need um, to make sure indeed that, that educational programs indeed are um, a fit for need to make sure that research directions indeed tailor to the things that uh, people are looking for. Um, so as an example there, I find it wonderful to see how well um, image recognition programs and algorithms can already support a physician or a doctor in spotting um, malicious tissue in all kinds of, of, of CT and MRI scans. Um, to a much faster and, 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 and higher level of certainty than, than a human could. However, the way our legislation and, and governance currently or, or, uh, organized makes it really hard to embed data science within the healthcare business, which for me is still a terrible shame because machines are capable of ingesting so much more data and learning so much better from feedback on how to to spot um, the images that a professional should look at. We should be making a lot more use of that. But that requires indeed a conversation between um, industry, technology, society, in this case, um, healthcare on, okay, what do you need? What do you look for? And how can we help each other? Um, for which you need, we're, we still have exciting times ahead because I'm sure that we'll get there in the next uh, 10 to 20 years as well. I think we will. I, I think it's of all the changes I'm most excited about. It's going to be some of this automation, and then the automation in turn will push down some of the pricing. And by pushing down some of the pricing, we'll now get this into either third world countries. We will we'll improve the medical care all around. Uh, in this sense, a rising tide will float all these boats. So I'm excited to see that change. For sure. Yeah. So going back to Bull, one thing I found interesting about your expansion plans was that they were more language-based than they were locale-based. So what sorts of things changes when you go from one language to another for your data teams? It's... um, Well, first off, you have the obvious one. Um, Most fields of information that you have uh, need to be duplicated. That's the obvious one. Um, I think second, that, that's the um, uh, the thing that you see happen a lot is about mindset. Do I see this as, okay, we had one, we're now going to add number two and that's it? 
Or do I see this go, going from, from one to N? So do I now implement a uh, technology or structure that allows us to scale you know, across the world? Or is it just this? Um, and I think what I've seen so far is um, that teams take radically different approaches to that question, um, resulting from the time they have available, um, the guidance that they receive, the approach that they have to the uh, to the problem. Um, that makes it, it, it really exciting to to see different approaches. Um, for which, on the one hand, you could argue that hey, if you are fully aligned, that everyone would uh, adopt the same approach. Um, however, by allowing for teams to have different approaches and to tailor their solution more to what's currently best fitting for their product, um, you allow for a lot more learning to happen as it goes. Um, also for a question like this, um, which for me, and, and uh, you've now getting a glimpse of that, uh, I like to have that. I like to have different perspectives, different approaches, um, different methodology, because that gives you a new perspective on what will happen. Because the future is uncertain. Um, you might have an idea now to, that will move into um, different companies, different countries, different languages. Um, but for now, it's just, it might just for now be a plan. Um, for as long as we're not there yet, that's all it is. Um, and that allows you to basically apply statistics and, and probability to what is the chance that we'll move there. Um, and different teams might assess those chances and risk differently. What do you find exciting in analytics right now? Poof. It's, um, I think a few things are very exciting about analytics at the moment. Um, first off, the sheer volume of data is growing. We have data about everything. It's, it's, I generate more data from the watch that I wear every single day than uh, we would have about the, the global census a few decades ago. It's, it, it's bizarre. And the reason why I find that exciting is because it allows you to pick up new use cases and new applications that were not available before. So that's one thing that's exciting. Um, second, and that's where I'm still also a bit of a techie myself, um, is that with that growing volume also comes an increase in uh, the quality of the tools that you use. So for instance, where in the past, um, basically you had a, a shell script and SQL, that was about it. Um, you're now seeing dedicated tooling coming up uh, to also support um, what's coming up as, as the analytics engineer, um, which allows you to both raise the bar in terms of quality, but also go to the next level in, in terms of what you're capable of doing, which again allows for, uh, for more use cases. And I think thirdly, um, given the fact that more and more people have been growing up with data and the possibility it has, also allows for more people to think about what is possible with data, how to use it, how not to use it, uh, and how it can actually make an impact in our daily lives and by doing things smarter or better or faster or easier, um, which again is all about growing the impact that data can have, uh, because that's, I think, the overarching theme of all three of those. Um, I am all about applying making it work, uh, finding the application that um, can make your life easier, smoother, or just put a smile on your face. Um, and the more we can do that, the more excited I'll get. So you've only briefly touched on your teams. You've talked about data scientists being in various teams. Could you sketch out your recommended team makeup for us? So the, the recommended team... Um, for, let's for now assume a semi-mature product. Because I think there where, where we spoke earlier also on, if you're just getting started, um, if you have a generalist, if you have a single software engineer, that's fine. Um, but let's assume indeed um, you've gone through the initial stages, uh, you have a rough idea of um, what your product typically does and solves, what would the team then look like? For which, uh, first and foremost, uh, I would always have a, a product owner, a product manager, someone that understands 
um, who's my customer and what's the problem I'm solving. Um, because from that understanding always follows the how do I do this? How do I solve this problem? If you then need to look into uh, the teams that are more, more frequent in my neck of the woods, um, so more of the, the data teams, um, typically I would always look into um, having some redundancy in the core skills uh, in terms of engineering and in data. So that would mean that you would have uh, two engineers, software engineers, um, and two uh, data scientists, data analysts, but people that are very data savvy, um, as a first set of five. That means that you have redundancy. That means that you have um, enough people to build quite a few things um, yourself without growing the team too big. And then the third element to look into is would always be what does my product specifically need? What sets my product apart from others? So for instance, in the world of online retail, some of our products are actually customer facing and some of them are not. So for instance, um, if you look at our search team, they, uh, of course, they produce uh, search results in terms of a list, but that list can be displayed into a wide range of, uh, of ways. So for those teams, I would add a designer. How, does, how do I present my results to my user in such a way that it's intuitive to, um, to look at? If I look at one of the teams that we have, for instance, our experimentation team, so we have a team dedicated to support uh, all of our, well, close to 200 software engineering teams that we now have at Boltcom in um, running experiments every single day. They have a, a full-time statistici statistician on board, someone who has a PhD in Bayesian statistics to make sure that not only the methodology that we use are sound, but there's also a sounding board for other teams that are looking into um, other teams that want to do an experiment. So there you need, you look into what does my team specifically need and how do I add that? And finally, um, is that the moment your team hits eight people, really start to think about, um, are there logical ways to, um, to redistribute tasks or to, um, uh, to further refine what my customer needs? Because if you start to look at teams of nine, 10, 11 people, just communication and, and make sure that all of those people indeed have sufficient uh, trust within each other becomes really hard to do. Um, so then we'd always look into, uh, into to, to splitting those up into smaller teams. But that's basically the, um, uh, the basic autonomy for a team for me. Of all the things you said, the, the one that was most interesting was having somebody with a PhD in Bayesian statistics. I've heard people with PhDs in statistics, but not never somebody called out specifically in Bayesian for the experimentation. So, it, it, it's, <laughs> I, I know there's there's a um, uh, a vivid um, how do you call it debate about the various ways on on, on how to look at at statistics and and uh, probability. Um, I, I, I believe in each case has, has specifically has a, a PhD in Bayesian statistics. I might be mistaken there, um, but indeed, um, if if you experiment on the scale at which uh, we do, with having dozens of experiments um, run every time, uh, you need to make sure that the methodology is sound because that's what you rely on every single day. Um, and doing that with people um, switching devices from a desktop to a mobile phone, uh, having people switch from um, different IP addresses from VPN to not, just tracking customers, making sure that your bucketing is okay, it's no easy feat. And that's, I think, where um, I'm really happy to work at a company that has the scale to that can afford themselves to have uh, a specialist like that also on board. Um, but also it allows us to offer a, um, a very fulfilling and very deepening job for something that people really care about, um, which I think is a really good thing. What do you never compromise on? Um, Other than Bayesian I statistics. <laughs> I was going to say nothing. 
I'm the type of person that sees merit in, in making trade-offs in, in a lot of things. Um, but that's the Dutch part of you. Yeah, it could very well be. It's, it's the one that, that never says never, or indeed then starts to become very literal on the word never. Um, I, th- I think the, the, the first one and that, that, that's most prominent and that I hope people will, will recognize me for is that I don't believe in keeping secrets and I don't believe in pe- telling people um, half the truth because you think you can make better choices than them in certain areas. Um, I'm the type of person that is open and transparent on what I know, what I think, what I feel. Um, because I believe that bringing everything to the table um, allows for better decision making, although it might be scary at times, although it might every now and then not get the result that you were hoping for. It's the way that I believe that you build relationships that last, um, which are a lot more valuable than transactional um, decisions you make regularly on a single day. Um, so I would argue that's a trade that's hardly ever compromised on. If there's one thing I should, I have to pick to never compromise on, um, it's about making puns and making sure that people laugh every now and then and not taking yourself too serious. That's, I think, the one that I'll, um, I hope I'll never grow too old and grumpy to do. Um, because it, 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 taking yourself too seriously just, you know, never works. I like that. Ne- never grow too old and grumpy to do a good pun. That's pretty punny. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I think so. So it's... Um, I'm also I'm still not out on the fact whether or not my wife stuck with me because of the puns or despite of the puns. Either way, I'm happy with that. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for answering all these questions. We really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing all this information about Bowl. No worries. Thanks, Jesse. Happy to have been there. And I think um, we've also also been uh, been saying is that Information and knowledge how to run these teams effectively should not be proprietary. Uh, you should be able to share that, to discuss that, and uh, to enhance each other's view by sharing. So um, thanks for the invitation. Always happy to do that. Another great story, another perspective shared on data and the tools, technologies, methodologies, and people that use it every day. I loved it. It was informative, refreshing, and just the right dose of inspiration. Remember to check dreamteam.soda.io for additional resources and more great episodes. We'll meet you back here soon at the Soda Podcast.